Let's talk about photosynthesis and light. Plants are the primary producers and they convert energy from the sun into forms usable by themselves and all other organisms. Light gives the energy input for photosynthesis, but not all photosynthesis reactions require light, as you'll see. Light can be limiting for plants in some situations, but mostly there's way more light than plants can take advantage of. Carbon uptake also can limit photosynthesis in certain situations. So the sun puts out a lot of radiant energy, but only some organisms can use it. It makes us feel good to be in the sun and lie on the beach, but we can't incorporate it. We still have to eat. So certain wavelengths of light activate... Um, photons in plants and they're perceived by pigments, the chlorophylls and accessory pigment, pigments absorb red and blue light from the spectrum. And looking at this action spectrum with the wavelengths across the bottom, you can see that chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B have slightly different absorption spectrums, but both basically in the blue and the red parts of the spectrum. Maybe this is why the world of plants is kind of green, because green light is not absorbed. It's reflected instead. The orange and yellow accessory pigments help leaves gather more light energy, absorbing in the blue and violet parts of the spectrum. And carrots have a lot of carotenoids, that's why they're orange, and in fall leaves we see those beautiful colors after the plants take back their chlorophyll before the leaves fall in the autumn. The sites of photosynthesis are chloroplasts, and chloroplasts are membrane-bound organelles that have internal membranes, and these internal membranes are called lamellae. If we look at the electron micrograph of the chloroplast, you can see all throughout there are these little membranes, internal lamellae, and here and there where they're stacked, these are called grana, the grana stacks. The stroma lamellae are just the single um, lamellae or membranes inside the matrix of the chloroplast. The stroma is the liquid matrix, and it's in that liquid matrix that the dark reactions of photosynthesis take place, called that because they don't require light. The light reactions take place on the membranes in the granostacks and the stroma lamellae. So normally, light energy enters the light reactions which then power the dark reactions and it's in the dark reactions that carbon dioxide is fixed and the organic molecule sugar is made. So there are three main steps in photosynthesis. The first two are light reactions, the third the dark reaction. In the Hill reaction the Sun's energy is used to split water molecules and to form the high energy NADPH from NADP. The second light reaction <clears throat> is called photosynthetic phosphorylation. Phosphorylation means adding a P, so this makes high energy ATP molecules. And then in the third step, we have dark fixation of carbon dioxide, and this is called the Calvin cycle, named after Melvin Calvin, who discovered it. So typical photosynthesis, which to differentiate it from other ones, is called C3 photosynthesis, since it has a three-carbon intermediate. First has the light reactions, where in the chloroplasts, the reactants water, ADP, inorganic 
phosphorus and NADP are transformed by sun's energy into two oxygen and two high energy entities ATP and NADPH. That energy then powers the dark reactions which take place also in the chloroplast in the stroma lamellae where carbon dioxide enters the chloroplast and high energy molecules are used to put those carbon dioxide molecules together into a six carbon sugar. And the products are ADP, reduced and inorganic phosphorus, and NADP. Most importantly, the products are sugars and the polymer of sugars, starch. So in this whole process, there initially is a five carbon intermediate ribulose diphosphate that splits to form two three carbon molecules PGA. This diagram shows the energy state of the two photosystems involved in the light reactions of photosynthesis. So starting from the lower energy level at the right hand side of the slide, a photon of light enters and splits water and these high energy electrons go through cytochrome transfer chain where ADP is phosphorylated to make ATP. Then another photon of light enters photosystem 1 and that high energy electron state is used to put the hydrogen on NADP. So there's two molecules that are storing energy, ATP and NADPH. So here's the Calvin cycle, the dark reactions of photosynthesis, in which energy from the light reactions here and here are used to keep this cycle going and with multiple turns around this here's the five carbon intermediate here's the three carbon intermediate for which C3 phot photosynthesis is named these processes put together CO2 into six carbon sugars, fructose and glucose, which together make the disaccharide sucrose and polymers of glucose, or these other ones, make starch and cellulose. Regular photosynthesis doesn't work well everywhere. There's a problem that when things are warm, carbon dioxide oxygen compete for the same sites and what happens is plants respire more in warm environments than they photosynthesize. They can kind of burn themselves up. But plants have evolved a special way to concentrate carbon dioxide inside their bundle, the vascular bundles, and they have bundle sheaths which make that area impermeable to carbon dioxide. So once carbon dioxide is in there, it's held inside, and so it can be used exclusively for photosynthesis, keeping oxygen out. So this anatomy is called Krantz anatomy, and we'll look, see what that looks like. You can see in this diagram from our book that oxygen competes with carbon dioxide and oxygen leads to photorespiration which is a bad thing but it might also be good because it can protect the photosystems by taking care of excess electrons. So there are two alternatives to regular C3 photosynthesis. C4 in which the light and dark reactions are spatially separated and CAM, 
short for Crashelian acid metabolism, in which those reactions are temporally separated. So C4 is useful when it's really hot, often in hot and humid places, and uses an alternative enzyme, PEP carboxylase, that doesn't catalyze photorespiration. And it also involves oxaloacetic acid, which is a 4-carbon intermediate. That's why it's called C4. In CAM photosynthesis, organic acids are used to store light energy during the day, and then at night, that energy fixes carbon into sugars. So here is the separation in space or compartmentalization we get in C4 photosynthesis. Light is captured in the mesophyll cells and carbon is fixed in the bundle sheath cells where carbon dioxide is concentrated and therefore photorespiration is avoided. The sheaths of vascular bundles are especially prominent in C4 plants. You can see how big these cells are. And this wreath-like arrangement with bigger vascular sheaths is called Krantz anatomy. Krantz in German means wreath. And so you can use a razor blade and a hand lens and in the field tell pretty easily a C4 from a C3 plant. I like this picture a lot. It shows at the top a tropical grass, sugar cane, C4, and a temperate zone grass, oats, at the bottom. And you can see the temperate zone grass vascular bundle sheaths are much smaller than the sheath around the vascular bundle in the C4 plant. So it takes energy to concentrate carbon dioxide, but it's worth it because in hot climates, plants might burn themselves up without growing at all. And consequently, very few northern plants are C4. In Canada, less than 10% of plants. In the northern U.S., 50% or less. And in the subtropics, like Florida, into the tropics, more than 70% of plants are C4. If we look just at grasses, we can see that there are many more the closer you get to the equator. An interesting thing about C4 plants is their optima for photosynthesis, temperature optima, are much higher. And here are two plants up from California, Camisonia, a C3 plant, which has its optimal photosynthesis in nice cooler temperatures, 24, 25 degrees in the 70s Fahrenheit. Whereas Amaranthus palmeri has its optimum nearer to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Physiologists have found that some plants are intermediate for example, our native plant, the yellow top, Flavaria linearis, is a C3, C4 intermediate. Let's say a little bit about CAM, Crashelian acid metabolism, special photosynthesis for hot, dry places like the desert. And it is found, it was formerly thought to be found only in succulent plants in dry environments, and people would look at terrestrial plants primarily. More recently, it's been found in other plants, as we'll read in some articles. In this kind of photosynthesis, light reactions and dark reactions are separated in time, so that the dark reactions take place at night when the stomata can be opened, temperatures are cooler and less water evaporates at that time. So in these plants, carbon dioxide is stored in malic acid, the crassulian acid, 
and then however much is stored can be photosynthesized, turned into sugars the next day. So cam plants make sugars during the day with the energy from the sun using the stored carbon dioxide from the night before. So the fatter or more succulent a plant is, the more carbon dioxide they can store and the more sugars they can make. And some cam species are also facultative. They can switch pathways when the weather is cooler during the day. Fairly recently, scientists discovered that epiphytic bromeliads are cam plants, many of them. And if you think about it, the conditions living high up in a tree can be pretty dry, maybe even desert-like, even in tropical areas. Here's a figure showing the rate of cam photosynthesis in species of different degrees of succulents, and they measured succulents by grams of water per unit area. So the less succulent species down here photosynthesize much less than the very fat-leaved species of Aeonium in the Crassulaceae. Many plants, when they grow in the shade, make leaves that are bigger than when they grow in the sun, and this is um, a strategy to catch more light with bigger, thinner leaves, the chloroplasts are more spread out. Also in shade, plants have more water available and chlorophyll per gram dry weight in shade is greater if you look at it, how it's spread over the leaf but in sun, there may be more total chlorophyll in those sun leaves. Here are cross sections through two leaves of the same species, one on the left growing in the sun, one on the right growing in the shade. And look at the mesophyll cells, palisade parenchyma. This, you find these full of chloroplasts and also in spongy mesophyll. Look at how much less well-developed these layers are in the shade leaf, but the leaf itself much bigger, more spread out to catch the flecks of light that might come through to the shade environment. A professor emeritus at FIU, David Lee, studied structural coloration. And he found that some leaves appeared blue because of an optical effect from thin film interference within the leaf. And many leaves, many of the plants that look this way are found in the understory of the tropical rainforest, which is a very low light environment. And it allows them to harvest longer wavelengths not depleted by the canopy above. Not only leaf morphology, but entire plant morphology is affected by light levels and we might call this phenotypic plasticity. An example can be seen in the velvet seed of our Everglades, Guitardus gabra, where hammock plants that grow in the shade may be 10, 15 feet or even taller. They have very big leaves and very few flowers and fruit, whereas plants in the pinelands growing in full sun <clears throat> are much shorter with smaller, thicker leaves and many flowers and fruit. So the pineland, being a fire successional habitat, reduces competition and shading, and so plants there mature at a smaller size and reproduce abundantly. So here to end with is just a picture of this plant, the roughly velvet seed, called velvet seed because the red velvety mature fruit are its namesake.